Today, I want to talk about the philosophy of learning music. If you found my channel, you're probably someone who's learning the piano as an adult or maybe learning another instrument and you're interested in music theory. Uh, and I think when we're looking for information on YouTube, um, sometimes we can get really focused in on things like music theory or how much we're practicing, we can start to think that that's the only thing that matters for improving at a music instrument. Um, but when I reflect on my own experience of growing as a musician over the years, I think there are actually a lot of things in the bigger picture of what allowed me to improve. Uh, so I wanted to share that with you today. I think there are six broad categories, six pillars of music education uh, that are important for every music student. So I'll share my own experience with those six categories, and it might lead you to some reflection on what role each of these pillars are playing in your life right now as a musician. Um, and maybe there are some that are a little weaker than others, and you might want to try some new things in those areas. So first is inspiration. Really everything as a musician comes out of feeling inspired about music and wanting to make music. For me, this actually started when I heard my sister playing piano when I was really little. I was lucky that I grew up in a musical home. My mom played piano growing up. Um, and so I would hear her playing. And when my sister started playing, I was so jealous, uh, this little five-year-old kid that I was. I really wanted to learn to play. And I begged my mom to teach me heart and soul. So that's the classic. <laughs> It's usually played as a duet. And my mom taught that to me. I thought it was so fun. And I would play it as a duet with my mom or my sister. Um, so that first bit of inspiration was just seeing the example from other people in my family. Maybe that's happened to you as well. Uh, but really throughout my life as a musician, it's always been hearing a great performance or a great record that has inspired me and made me want to keep making music and improve as a musician. Uh, so for you, you know, pay attention to what inspires you. It might be listening to music you love. It might be watching live performances. It might even be watching teachers or performances on YouTube. If that inspires you, that's great. Um, and it's probably a combination of all these things. But just remember that the inspiration is important. We can't separate that from our art making. Um, and especially if you're someone who likes structure and discipline and maybe you're setting yourself goals with your practice, um, don't feel bad if it's helpful to spend like the first half of your practice time just getting inspired. Uh, because really, if you can't get inspired, you're just going to want to stop playing. Um, and so the most important thing is that you're excited about what you're doing. There's nothing wrong with spending a lot of your time at the instrument, listening to pieces of music and deciding what's really exciting to you. I'm going to call pillar number two access. So this is meant to cover everything from having an instrument available for you to play to having great information. Um, and the information part is better now than it has ever been in history because there is so much free information available online. Um, along with things like online courses, I make online courses. There's all sorts of places you can get relatively affordable information using the internet. When I was growing up, the information was all coming from like music books, sheet music books, and the private lessons that I took um, as a child. And that was also great information. I mean, the advantage of that is there isn't the overwhelm that you might get from looking for information online. Access really now is better than ever. But remember, it includes access to an instrument and any instrument is better than none. And what I find with my private students is that usually the weeks where they don't practice are just weeks where they don't have access to the instrument. Like maybe they're traveling and they're away from their piano or their keyboard. And they're just not gonna practice if they're traveling. Um, so if you don't have an instrument or a lot of people on this channel comment that they don't have a sustain pedal, uh, take that as your single most important task is to figure out how to get that tool that you need uh, or that information that you need so that you can move forward on your instrument. All right, number three is fairly obvious, it's practice. And I'm sure you're aware of this. You can't get good at a music instrument without practicing. Um, and I get a lot of questions about how much to practice from students or how long you need to practice a certain amount to get good. Um, and it's hard to give concrete answers about this uh, because really every person is different and it depends so much on what your goals are. But 
I can share my own experience. You know, I was lucky that I started early with classical piano. I didn't practice more than an hour a day um, for the first, like, I don't know, five or 10 years I was playing piano. Um, and if anything, I kind of got away with not practicing as much as my older sister. Um, and I would maybe practice a lot the day before my lesson. Um, but the rest of the time I was kind of a delinquent music practicer. Um, but then there came a point where I was really serious about music and then I started practicing a lot. And really to be a professional musician, you need to be spending a lot of time on your instrument. Um, so there was a period of, I'd say five to 10 years where I was practicing maybe an average of three hours a day, sometimes a lot more than that, sometimes a lot less. Um, and I think that that's kind of a common denominator with all of the professional musicians I know is that there is at least some formative period where they were practicing hours and hours a day to get really good at their instrument. So if you're really serious about music, um, you should be grounding your expectations in that. You know, if the reality of your life is that you just don't have that amount of time to spend on your instrument, well, music might be a really rewarding hobby for you, um, but you shouldn't expect to reach a professional level. And I think there's another really important concept, which is kind of a, a cruising altitude or like an escape velocity that you can reach when you practice a new thing. Uh, like if you practice something a lot for a period of time and you reach a new level where suddenly now you're able to do something in the professional world of music and that's just part of your career or your daily life uh, or you get good enough that at least you can join a band uh, even if it's totally amateur and a hobby thing if you're joining a band and you're seeing your friends every week to play music in the band well that's built into your life and that will be some additional practice time um, but you might have to put in the practice first just to get to the point where you even feel comfy like playing chords with friends in a band. And there is just a huge range of how people's brains work when it comes to practice. Some people really like a lot of discipline. Some people are super intuitive and open-ended with it and are just guided by like wanting to play the songs that they like the most. Um, and you should really follow whatever seems to work best for you. The one thing I can say beyond a doubt is that you will not regret any time you spend practicing your instrument. And especially with students who are trying to choose between like, oh, how much of my time should I be spending on drills or scales versus songs? Or what should I be doing exactly with my practice time? I like to remind people that really all of it is gonna help. Um, everything has its own set of rewards depending on what you wanna do with the instrument. Um, and in my experience, I've had phases of practicing lots of different instruments. I've practiced lots of different things over the years. There has never been a time where I've looked back on something that I was practicing in music and regretted it. So whatever time you want to put towards practice and have to put towards practice, I say, go for it. And you're probably gonna be thanking yourself uh, later on in your life. All right, we've covered inspiration, access, and practice. And I think these are the most obvious things, but there are some other categories that you might neglect. I think a lot of us who are exploring, learning an instrument online, on a place like YouTube, might not be thinking about these as much. Pillar number four is accountability. And I actually think this is the most valuable part of having private lessons, regular weekly music lessons. It's maybe the information and the feedback and guidance you get from a teacher. But actually, I think when I give private lessons, the biggest impact I have on my students' lives is just that they know they're gonna see me every week. And it's this, this element of like weekly accountability to improve at your instrument. Um, that's the reason why I continue to take weekly private lessons whenever I'm learning a new instrument as an adult. I just think it's so valuable just to have someone there with you on the journey um, and checking in with you every week. Now, private lessons are not for everyone. They might be out of your budget and they also just don't appeal to everyone. Like a lot of people want the sort of freedom and independence that you get from just learning on your own. Um, but if you are a self-guided learner and you don't want to take weekly lessons, think about ways where you can have other people involved in your progress on the instrument. You know, something like a weekly band practice or even just uh, 
posting your progress on social media, something where other people know what you're doing and know what your goals are, that creates this accountability where it's not just a you thing, it's something where your improvement at the instrument is expected by other people. Um, and that's been my own experience, that pretty much whatever I learn in music is basically what I'm expected to learn, with a few exceptions. Now that overlaps a bit with pillar number five, which is performance. Having performances on the books is so motivating. If you know you're gonna play a recital or a concert, um, or you're gonna make a video to put online, like those things will really motivate you to practice. Um, so I think this is why typically music teachers who are running studios of lots of private students will have like a spring recital, summer recital, winter recital. It's partly just to get the practice of performing in front of other people, but it's also that without that recital on the books, none of the students really want to practice. So for me, this was always motivating. You know, whenever I was taking lessons growing up, there were recitals in the books. When I was going to music school, I would have my juries at the end of the semester. And then as I moved into uh, playing and working as a professional musician, there would be gigs and shows that would motivate me uh, to prepare music. For you, even if you don't have a school recital or like a professional gig to play, you can find ways to create performance opportunities. You could just have a house concert where you tell your friends you're going to play some of your new piano pieces for them. Or you could go to an open mic, which is kind of a terrifying experience, but there are usually open mics in every city um, and you can sign up and you'll probably learn a lot that way and it will be very motivating for you. Or you can just post performances of the songs you're working on on social media. And that's a really accessible, easy way to add some performance into your musical life. And the last pillar is connected to these other things, but I think it's worth considering on its own. And that is community. Community is the people we surround ourselves with and the input they have on our musical lives. For me, the best part of going to music school was all of my fellow classmates whom I met and most of whom are still close friends and important musical collaborators to this day. So if, you, if you're just learning about music from YouTube videos, there's a chance you feel kind of isolated in what you're doing. You know, maybe you, you got into this just because YouTube suggested it to you and you realized, oh, this is so cool, I love music. Uh, and I think that's amazing. If you're in that position though, and you feel like, well, I don't really know anyone else who plays music or I don't have other people in my life who are involved in this passion of mine, seek out some community. Um, and obviously it's a little more challenging as an adult than it is if you are growing up going to music classes in school or you're, you're going to a music college, but you can find community as an adult. You know, seek out other people who wanna join a band. There are a lot of community music schools that do have adult ensembles in various genres of music. There's an online music school that a friend of mine started. Uh, it's called School of Song that I highly recommend. I've taught some group classes for them in the past and their whole MO is community. They're trying to connect like-minded adult music learners and songwriters specifically. Um, and you can sign up for a songwriting workshop with them, which are always taught by a music artist. So you're meeting lots of other people who like the same music as you. So I highly recommend School of Song. It's a really cool organization. And for my own part, I'm making plans about how to add more of a community element to what I do with piano fluency. Uh, there's nothing like that as yet on my website, but if you're watching this in the future, you might head to my website, pianofluency.com, and I have some ideas about how I might make a membership or community for people to connect with each other if you're learning these piano fundamental skills that I like to teach on YouTube. So I hope this framework of thinking about the six pillars of music education uh, is helpful to you. I hope maybe it's a chance for you to bring up the quality of one of these pillars in your own growth as a musician. And in the meantime, I hope you're having a great time with your journey with music. Thanks for joining me in this video. My name is Ted. Happy practicing.